Last week, we looked at the first four verses of 2 Peter chapter 1. It is a very spiritually rich experience because Peter assures us of some things that we have. We have obtained a precious faith, a like precious faith with him. And his divine power, God's divine power has given to us all things <clears throat> that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. And we find the knowledge of him in the word of God. And we have been given exceedingly great and precious promises. And when God promises something, he delivers. So this is the thrust of Peter's message last week. And he tells us in, in verse 1 who he is, he tells us who we are, and what we have. Those things I just enumerated. And now in light of this, <clears throat> Peter lets us know what we are to do. And that's found in the verses that were read by our brother Jim this morning. And again, by way of review, the context of Peter's inspired teaching is the prevalent first century false teaching being peddled by false teachers. And in order to confront these heretics and their damaging doctrine, Peter knows faithful Christians need to be spiritually fit and strong in the faith to engage in this spiritual struggle. And therefore, as faithful children of God, we need to keep a very close watch on our personal lives. The Christian life demands diligence in pursuing noble qualities like moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and a selfless, Christ-like love. So in contrast, <clears throat> these false teachers who are damaging the Lord's church, they have no moral compass. They have no ethical standard. And they are sensual, they're arrogant, they're greedy, and they're covetous. But having been called by glory and virtue, the Christian has now escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, Peter says in verse 4. So for this very reason, we are to give all diligence to add to our faith, that is to nourish our faith, to strengthen our faith, to fortify our faith. We're to add these seven godly attributes. Giving all diligence means that we will eagerly and earnestly strive for, that is we will expend great effort toward gaining what have traditionally been referred to as the Christian graces. <clears throat> and that's the seven moral qualities that Peter is about to identify for us. And this is to be done willingly, it is to be done purposefully, and it is to be done enthusiastically. As these graces become an integral part of our lives, you and I will be brought to a very high degree of spiritual maturity and completeness in Christ. Isn't that where we want to be? That's where we want to be. And we then are to add to our faith. And what is our faith? Our faith is our firm, here our faith is our firm conviction of divine truth. We believe in the word of God. And we acknowledge God as creator and as our God, as our Lord and our Savior. So our faith is our firm conviction of this divine truth. So the first of these moral qualities is virtue. And in the Greek, this particular word, arete, is used only four times in the New Testament. I found that interesting. And two of these passages refer to God. And the other two passages 
refer to a quality of man. So virtue literally means moral excellence or moral goodness. We live in a society that is morally destitute today. So this is very important. This noble quality represents a righteous and honorable development and progression of thought, feeling, and action. So it's strongly associated with things like, <clears throat> you may be surprised at this, it's associated with things like manliness. That's in jeopardy today. Manliness, valor, modesty, purity, all of those things are in great jeopardy today. Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, watch, stand fast in the faith, be bold like men, and be strong. This is in essence an exhortation for Christians to possess this noble quality, this virtue. And this spiritual strength, as with the other six Christian graces, is rooted in and grounded in the strength and character of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we imitate Him, don't we? We emulate Him. We look to Him. Our focus is on Him. We concentrate on Him. The second moral quality is knowledge. And this is a very familiar Greek word, gnosis, which signifies a general intelligence and understanding. And it can also be applied to moral wisdom, such as is seen in right living, right conduct. For the Christian, it is a working knowledge of the spiritual truths found in God's Word. So this would be very akin to wisdom, which we say is application, uh, working application of, of our knowledge. So it is a working knowledge of the spiritual truths found in God's word. For the Lord gives wisdom. Out of his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Proverbs chapter 2 verse 6 says. So there's, with all these, there's kind of an overlap. They don't always stand alone. They're kind of inextricably linked together. And we need to remember that it's a lack of knowledge of God's divine will that can bring about the falling away and the ultimate destruction of of God's people. What can do that? Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge of God's word. As the inspired prophet Hosea observed in Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, my people are destroyed. How, Hosea? By a lack of knowledge. So this is why we're admonished in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now why would the inspired writer talk about rightly dividing the word of truth? Because the word of truth can be wrongly divided, it can, and it often is. So we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. So, therefore, do not be unwise. We just looked at this verse this morning. Do not be unwise. We don't want to be in the category of the unwise. But understand what the will of the Lord is. What's that going to take? Study. Time spent in the Word of God. That's found in Ephesians chapter 5, 17, by the way. The third Christian grace is self-control. This is temperance in the King James Version. And this is the virtue of one who masters his desires and passions, especially his sensual appetites. Jesus taught, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. John chapter 8, verse 34. And Peter expounds on this idea in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses going down to verse 18. So here... Peter is discussing these false teachers who are wreaking havoc in the Lord's church. And he says in verse 18, For when they speak great swelling words, they're very um, eloquent speakers, gifted speakers. 
For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they don't mean a thing. They allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. A very powerful word usage that Peter is using here. Now, here's where we really want to pay attention. Peter says, and this mirrors what the Lord taught, for by whom a person is overcome, whatever temptation, whatever type of ongoing sin, for of whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. So many people are in bondage to certain types of sin, and that's what he's talking about. But those who are running the Christian race, who compete for the prize, Paul says, is temperate in all things. In other words, they exercise self-control. That's 1 Corinthians 9.25. The control the child of God has over himself is the control that he allows the Lord Jesus Christ to have over him. This is through submission to the Lord's will. So we submit to the Lord's will. We say, not my will, but thine be done. And that's how we exercise self-control, because we submit to the Lord and to his will. Because, as Galatians 5.24 says, because those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh. Colossians will say, mortify the deeds of the body. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Self-control is listed as one of the aspects of the fruit of the Spirit there in Galatians chapter 5, verse 23. And as such, this self-control is an identifying mark, it's a hallmark, it's a trademark of the faithful Christian. So just as others will know we are Christians by our love, as the song says... They will also know that we are Christians by our diligent exercise of self-control. As you and I deal with difficult people. Anyone in here have to deal with difficult people? Or as we deal with difficult situations. They'll see how we act and how we react. And that's what prompts them to ask us a reason of the hope we have. In Jesus Christ and we need to be ready to give that answer so the grace of self-control allows us to join with the Apostle Paul in disciplining our body and bringing it into subjection 1 Corinthians 9 27 and to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5 the next moral quality of Christian grace is perseverance. This is patience in the King James Version. And this is a great word. And it literally means to abide under trial. <clears throat> Think about that. To abide under trial. But it goes even further. I almost wish it didn't have this attached to it. Listen to this. Perseverance, patience, means to abide under trial with cheerful and hopeful endurance. Now that's setting the bar pretty high, isn't it? That is setting the bar pretty high. I can abide under trial, but you don't want to be around me a lot of the times. But this says with cheerful and hopeful endurance. And I say, wow, to that. So this is a steadfast endurance, a patient continuance under trial. For the sake of Christ. For the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's, that's our motivation. That's why we do it. And it refers to one who is devoted to God and committed to his faith. And is not swerved nor deterred from his deliberate purpose, even during the greatest of trials, while enduring affliction and suffering. That's... Again, the bar is set, set pretty high. <clears throat> and we're to do this 
And here's another verse. If I was going to cut verses out of my Bible, this might be one I might cut out. And we're to do this without complaining and disputing. We're to do it without murmuring and arguing, according to Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. So, again, the bar is set even higher. So according to our brother James, patience, perseverance, perfects Christian character and strengthens our faith, fortifies our faith. James chapter 1, verse 4. And this grace is desperately needed as you and I sojourn in this wicked, sinful, and troubled world. How we need patience and perseverance. As our Lord taught, in the world you shall, that means it's going to happen, in the world you shall have tribulation. So that's John 16.33. The scriptures make clear that in this fallen world we will have trouble. We will experience problems and difficulties. We will suffer and have to endure pain. That's all part of life in this world. As Acts 14.22 says, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. This is the narrow gate. This is the narrow way. The grace of patience and perseverance will provide spiritual strength and moral stamina to help you and I faithfully endure the struggles of this life and to effectively confront the wickedness of an evil world. And our God will see to it that the faithful Christian is strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. First, or, uh, that's Colossians chapter 1, verse 11. And <clears throat> the patience used here, the perseverance, is the same Greek word as our moral quality, as our Christian grace. Same Greek word. So... The faithful Christian is strengthened by God with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. A lot of times we rush right by that, but with joy. So the Christian doesn't go around as a sourpuss. Not according to this. And this noble quality will support and help the child of God to successfully navigate this troubled planet. As the scripture says, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. That's beautiful. Philippians chapter 2 verse 15. You shine as lights in the world. The world's in darkness, isn't it? The world's in darkness because of sin, steeped in sin. You and I, when we go out into the workplace, into the marketplace, into our neighborhood, we shine as lights in the world. Maybe the only spiritual light that people see. The fifth Christian grace is godliness. And this word literally refers to one who is, who is pious and devout. And it includes qualities like sincere reverence and deep respect towards God. And godliness here is not so much God-likeness, but god wordness. That is a state of mind which accepts and acknowledges God as the sole object of one's adoration and reverential respect, the central object of one's trust and the infallible source and concentrated focus of one's religious duty. That is powerful. The Apostle Paul stated that we are to pursue righteousness, godliness, there's our, there's our word, we're to pursue godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. And 1 Timothy 4, 7 tells us we are to exercise ourselves unto godliness. So when you think about the word exercise, that brings some things to mind, doesn't it? You know, you're, you're expending some effort here. You're working at it. The word translated exercise is the Greek word gymnazo, 
from which we get our English word gymnasium. Isn't that interesting? So to add this godliness to our faith, you and I need to go into strict training. We need to go into a strict training regimen, and we need to exercise ourselves spiritually and vigorously toward that end. But we need to know and be assured that our efforts will be worth it. It will pay rich dividends, just as physical exercise does in the physical realm. One who possesses godliness can know that he has faithfully obeyed the divine command, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. To sanctify is to, to set apart. Set apart the Lord God in your hearts. Without that, anything else you and I try to do will be an effort in futility. Till God is on the throne of our hearts. He is at the center of our lives. <clears throat> the Christian grace of godliness is essential in that it prompts us, yea, even compels us to observe ethical standards and obey moral laws. Why do we do this? Because of our respect and because of our reverence for the, for the divine lawgiver. That's why we do it. And when you and I observe ethical standards, and when you and I obey moral laws, we're going to shine as lights in the world. Because the world is in darkness. And we know that ethics and morality are <clears throat> in jeopardy in our society these days. Amen? So this is an attitude that sees <clears throat> the true meaning of life in its relationship to God. Everything begins with God. He is the foundation. He is the source of our focus and concentration. And <clears throat> this is an attitude that reflects lives that by the power of God and for God glorify God in everything we think, say, and do. We, we want to bring honor and glory to God in everything we do. The sixth Christian grace is brotherly kindness. And this is the very familiar Greek word, Philadelphia. The first part of the word comes from the adjective phylos, meaning friend or beloved. And this word is derived from the Greek word phileo, which is a friendship or family love. And the second part of the word Philadelphia comes from the noun Adelphos, and Adelphos means uh, brother. So the word means brotherly love or brotherly kindness, Philadelphia. We know that Philadelphia is a city of brotherly love. Well, not anymore. I correspond with a Christian sister down there, Betty and I have known for over 40 years, and it's not the city of brotherly love anymore. It's sad. <clears throat> so, it literally means loving someone like a brother. That's Philadelphia. And it includes a deep level of affection and kind-heartedness that is shown and demonstrated warmly and unreservedly towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. In other words, it's exuberant. It's exuberant. It's genuine, it's sincere, it's real. It's not just a kind of going through the motions type thing. And this love readily recognizes the difference between those in the Lord and those who are of the world. As the scripture says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. There's our word, Philadelphia. There it is. In honor, <clears throat> giving preference to one another. That's Romans chapter 12, verse 10. And this grace is important because without the love of the brethren, there can be no love for God. 
That's why this is so important. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. <clears throat> And let's go down to verse 19. So 1 John chapter 4, 19 says, We love him because he first loved us. God took the first step. He had to. God took the first step toward our salvation. So our hearts are touched by the gospel to see and to know and to acknowledge the extent to which God was willing to go to save our souls. He sent His only begotten Son to suffer, bleed, and die for us to die in our place. That's why the Scripture says we love Him, because He first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. That's not hard to misunderstand, is it? Pretty blunt. But it has to be. So if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Good question. And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. <clears throat> now we understand that <clears throat> some of our brethren are pretty hard to love. But that's where the last Christian grace comes in, agape. So, so, although it is different, uh, Philadelphia is closely related to agape, which is the last Christian grace or moral quality that Peter uh, talks about. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, we read, Concerning brotherly love, there is Philadelphia, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, to agape one another. There's the two in the, in the same sentence. So they're very closely related. Concerning brotherly love, Philadelphia, so important. You have no need that I should write to you, Paul says, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, to agape one another. Again, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. So this grace helps bring about a powerful bond in the body of Christ, which serves both to form and fortify our Christian fellowship. Very, very important. So may we, as Hebrews 13.1 admonishes, let brotherly love continue. That's what the scripture says. Let brotherly love continue. It's the cement kind of holds us together, strengthens and fortifies our fellowship and our communion. The seventh and final moral quality is love. And this, of course, is agape love that we talk a lot about and we should. This love is important because it's a divine love. In fact, it's the love that describes and defines God himself. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, tells us that God is love. God is agape. That describes and defines God, agape. For God so loved the world, for God so agape the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God so agape the world. And this love is also a fruit of the Spirit, as described in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. And as a divine love, and as a fruit of the Spirit, this love is not able to be generated or appropriated by the carnal man. It can only be appropriated by the spiritual man. It is, as 1 Corinthians 13 says, verses 4 through 8, describes so beautifully a godly characteristic of the sanctified spiritual man. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, you're getting a great definition of agape love. And you can put, instead of love is, you can put God is. 
or God is not, because God is agape. You can put it in there. If you want to do a um, challenging spiritual self-test, put your name in there. Terry is patient. Terry is loving. Terry is kind. Ooh. Spiritual self-test. That's for the brave ones in here, those who are brave. Um, <clears throat> now that... Okay. So this love, this agape love, includes emotion, but it is not controlled by emotion. That's an important distinction. This love is an unselfish, self-sacrificing love. It's the love that Christ had for you and for me when he died on the cross. Agape love is a decision to love the unlovable, a decision to love the undeserving, a decision to love the ungrateful, regardless of their race, regardless of their nationality, social standing, or their circumstances. We love them because, why do we love them? Because their souls, their eternal souls, are precious to God. We're commanded to love them. Because their souls are precious to God. Christ died for them too. A lot of times I'll have somebody cut me off in traffic and I want to, you know, respond or something. I'll say, well, Christ died for them too. That helps me. Helps me process it a little bit. Calms me down. Christ died for them too can be a challenge, amen? So, this final moral quality is the finishing crown of the Christian graces, if you will, because it reflects the very nature and the very character of God. God is agape. He is. It, it defines him. It describes him perfectly. But above all things, put on love, put on agape, which is the bond of perfection. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. To which I can only add, amen. Amen. And now that Peter has told us what we are to do, we're to add to our faith these seven moral qualities. Now he tells us why we're to do it in verse 8 of our text, going back to 2 Peter. <clears throat> For if these things are yours, an integral part of your life, if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if these things are yours, if they're an integral part of your spiritual life, and abound, in other words, they're ever increasing, they exist in abundance, and are ever increasing in quality, and efficacy, I love that word, but it, it means usefulness. You're useful to God in His service. They will make you that you will neither be barren, and that means inactive, ineffective, useless. Who wants to be in that category? Not me. Inactive, ineffective, and useless. Not accomplishing the labor which one ought to perform. Slacker. Idle, lazy, nor unfruitful, not yielding what one ought to yield or produce. We don't want to be in the category of being barren or unfruitful in our knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the Greek word epinosis, which is a precise and correct knowledge of divine truth that we find in God's Word. So next, Peter talks about what happens if we don't? What happens if I don't? add these moral qualities, these Christian graces to my faith. Well, verse 9. Peter says, For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So, <clears throat> This blindness is, of course, spiritual blindness. We talked about that in Bible class this morning. In other words, this person can no longer discern spiritual matters or spiritual truths. It's kind of dull in the faith. So, he says, he who lacks these things is short-sighted, can't see all that far ahead, 
even to blindness, spiritual blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins, he perhaps take, is taking it for granted, or he's regarding the sacrifice of Christ lightly, or it just doesn't do much for him anymore. He's heard the gospel story so many times, it just, it's old stuff, it just doesn't touch his heart anymore. He's becoming somewhat desensitized. Then Peter talks about something else we are to do in verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. King James says, you shall never fall. This one says, never stumble. I like fall so much better uh, in the King James. So, what hap <clears throat> this is what we are to do. We are to be more diligent. So not only are we to be diligent, we are to be more diligent. That is, we are to endeavor, we are to exert ourselves. We are to labor, we are to make every effort. We are to study in earnest. Not just a flippant, but we are to study in earnest. We are to be serious about it. To make our calling and election sure. We talk a lot about how we are called. We are called by the gospel. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. So, to make our calling and election sure, we could reference Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. We're to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. We're called by the gospel. So we're to walk worthy of the teachings and the doctrines of the gospel. Just as you were called in one hope of your calling, verse 4 says in Ephesians 4. To make your calling and election sure. So this word election causes folks a lot of problems. There's a lot of false teaching about it. The word is described, I think, in such a concise and accurate way in the Scripture. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Here's election, according to God's Word. Just as He chose us, God chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Now, can you get your minds around that? I can. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Be thinking about God's plan of salvation, His plan of redemption. <clears throat> he chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. It was his, uh, the good pleasure of his will to save us from our sins, even though it meant the, the death of his only begotten son. So this, brothers and sisters, is the gospel. It was God's eternal plan of redemption that he instituted even before the foundation of the world and was manifested in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son. That's election. Make your calling election sure. Sure means stable, firm, steadfast, not shaky, not unstable. And if you do these things, you shall never fall. So fall means to err, to sin, to fail of salvation. Paul talks about, after I have fought the fight, I myself might be a castaway. That's the idea. To fail of salvation through ongoing sin. Finally, Peter takes great pleasure in highlighting what will happen when we do these things that he has talked about. He affirms God's promise to the faithful. In other words, our eternal reward. And that's found in verse 11. This is so beautiful, it's almost poetic. For so an entrance will be supplied to you. Put your name in there. Make it personal. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, that's our hope. Sound good? Sound good? should, and it should also motivate us to service, 
to willing and obedient, faithful service to God in this life. So this is the confident and encouraging hope of those who have obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the author. That is, he is the origin. He is the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So if you're here this morning and you've not obeyed the gospel, that is, you have never repented of your sins, you've never confessed Christ before others, you've never been baptized for the remission of your sins, God is graciously giving you this opportunity this morning to do just that. And if you have obeyed the gospel, but there is unresolved, unrepented of sin in your life, God is graciously giving you opportunity to take care of that this morning as well. Whatever your need, please respond to Christ's invitation. It's His invitation. Respond to the Lord's invitation this morning. As we stand, as we sing.